Hello, I'm David Belvin. I'm Managing Director at Clemson Cummings, Chartered Accountants uh, here in Romford. And we're just wanting to have a little session about being a director and what it means and some of the tax pitfalls that we can avoid. Um, we'll go on, we'll, we'll talk about cars, we'll talk about dividends and against salaries. We'll talk about director's loan accounts, which is an area many of our clients trip over uh, or don't trip over because we make sure that they stay inside the law. And uh, then we'll touch on other areas we might think about capital allowances and R&D tax credits. So let's start off with cars. The question I'm so frequently asked is, should I have a company car? Should the company pay for my fuel? What's a pool car? And of course, more recently, should I be thinking about an electric car? And I think, as with many of the questions that we'll be posing, or I'll be posing myself uh, through, through this chat, it's going to be, it all depends. Let's just think about company cars for the moment. Because if you have a company car, then your company will pay national insurance on the deemed benefit. You will pay income tax on that benefit. And depending on how um, bad a polluter that vehicle is, so you know, if, you're, if you're up at sort of 160 grams uh, of carbon per kilometer, one of the really thirsty ones, then you could be paying 36 to 38% if it's a diesel, another few percentage on top of that of the value when new. So if you, uh, like me, uh, would like to uh, think about acquiring a company car that's maybe just done uh, six months old or a year old, done a few thousand miles, get a nice big discount. If you put it through the company, you're going to pay tax on the value when new. And not its current value, not what you paid, and if it's two or three years down the line, then you're still going to be paying tax on that original price when new, with all the bits that were fitted to it. So it can be quite expensive. Mm -hmm. um, it does, of course, mean the company bears the depreciation. The company uh, will be insuring the car for you and all those things. But that's what the benefits is meant to assess. Um, I'd say I'm in increasingly less uh, a fan of having a company car. Generally, for those reasons, um, it's, it can be very expensive. And of course, the value is depreciating on a regular basis. And so I find our clients are are paying a lot more tax than they might otherwise do. And ultimately, I think they're probably better off if they own the car personally. But it all depends because it depends on the vehicle, um, what the depreciation is likely to be, um, how many miles you're doing. Because if you're doing a lot of miles, private miles, so you live a long way away from your company and you're traveling every day, then you might want to think about, do I want the company to pay for my fuel? Well, currently on that 160 gram per, per kilometer uh, car, you'd probably be uh, assessed on a benefit of, of just, uh, just under 8,900 pounds, because it, it's, 24,600 is the deemed benefit times the percentage of the value when new. So that currently equates to about 1,400 gallons. Well, if you're doing 30 miles a gallon, then, and you might be on a long trip, of course, then that's 40,000 private miles a year you're being taxed on. And it's an either or benefit. Either the company is providing fuel for you or the company isn't. So, but unless 
there are special circumstances. I just would not be having a company car. Or, unless, of course, it's an electric one. At uh, CHC, two of our directors, whose uh, vehicle leases were coming to an end, we've just decided that they, uh, they're they better off if they fund through the company by way of salary sacrifice and that sort of thing, uh, having an electric car. So there's some VAT that can be picked up on the lease payments. They are paying from uh, 5th of April or 6th of April 2022, they're being assessed on a benefit of just 2% of the value of the car when new. 2% this year, it's 1%. And so that makes vehicle ownership for a pure electric car inside a company quite attractive. The next question, of course, is do I buy or do I lease? And the question I then put to my clients is what do you think the second hand value is going to be? Because if you're very happy that the second hand values are going to stay high, then you may want. The, the asset inside the company. Um, if you are unsure, then you may want the leasing company to take the risk. Um, if it's the company that's buying the asset, then from 5th of April 2021, you can claim 100% first year allowance on that vehicle. Um, so all of a sudden, the whole of the value of the vehicle gets set off against this year's profits, which could be quite attractive for some, depending on what their company looks like, the profits in the company. No point in getting tax relief if your profits aren't that high. Um, so company cars, uh, if they're normal diesel or, or, or petrol, I'm not so sure about, but it all depends. And, Give us a chat, talk, talk to us about it, talk to your engagement director as to whether in your particular circumstances such a car is, is worthwhile. And also for your employees, again, it all depends. Uh, electric cars, I think, are an attractive uh, proposition at the moment, and there's grants available for, um, uh, and subsidies available for, for putting the electric charging points in your uh, uh, office premises and as was recently uh, announced is going to be a requirement for new homes and they're trying to build if you like the informal infrastructure uh, for car charging so one thing about electric cars i would say is we are just about to put out on our website uh, a little article about electric cars that David Bransbury's had a lot to do with. He's, uh, he's got one of those cars and uh, he's very happy with it. The information is really useful. So please, please do go to that. So that's vehicles. Let's, uh, how do we get money out of our company? Well, the first thing is to make sure if you are spending money um, that is, for the purpose of the business and you're paying for it out of your pocket then make sure you do your own expenses reimbursement because then you can get tax relief on the expenditure if it's entertaining you won't get tax relief but there's no point in you paying for it personally when the company can and should really the only other way is of getting money out of a company or through dividends or through salary and if you end up borrowing from the company that's going to have a tax impact which we will touch on later when we talk about directors loan accounts so let's let's talk about what happens with a salary so salaries are good they help with uh, uh they help when you're trying to borrow money uh, for mortgage applications and all those sorts of things. But many of our directors are in the house where they want to be for the next number of years. They don't need, they're not thinking about borrowing personally. 
um, why would they have a salary? Well, if you have a salary, then you're going to pay tax on the income. You're going to pay NISH insurance if you're under 67. Uh, that's currently 12%, but it's going to go up to 13.25% next April and for a year. And then it'll come back down to 12%, uh, uh, to but you're going to have a... Uh, a care fund levy of 1.25%, so it's a bit like national insurance, really. Um, and your national insurance on anything over 50,000 um, goes down to 2% and will be 3.25%. But of course, if you own the company, you're also paying the employer's national insurance. The employer's national insurance, currently 13.8%, is going to go up to 15.05% for a year. Now, that's quite an expensive um, way of funding payments for many people, although not all. And I'll touch on that in a minute. Of course, you get corporation tax relief on the salary. You get corporation tax relief on uh, the employer's national insurance contributions. Currently, that's at 19%. Of course, from 6th of April 2023, that's going to be at 25%. So all of our sums that we do to work out whether dividends and salaries are a good idea, which one's best, are going to need to change again. But currently, there's only a few circumstances where it's more tax efficient to take a salary than a dividend. But you do need to take some salary. Um, it helps with qualifying years for your state pension. And if you have a contract of employment uh, running alongside your uh, director's service contract, but assuming you've got a contract of employment, so there's, there's a few of you as directors of the company um, and you've got a formal agreement in place, I would be careful about um, minimum wage, but still living wage. You do need to make sure you have not fallen into a little hole that as you with a required number of hours per week in an agreement paying yourself less than the national minimum wage so that's that's just a little pitfall that you could walk into and you want to avoid so you know you're going to be paying you could be paying yourself a salary of about seventeen thousand pounds just to make sure that you sit inside the law, but thereafter, you would want to possibly look at dividends. Now, if you're setting up a company, or indeed reconstituting a, a company, and there's more, than, say there's more than one director in the, in the company, both of whom are properly working in the business, then you may want to take different amounts out by way of dividend and a way through that is to set the company up with what we call alphabet shares. So different classes of shares can have different levels of dividend. But if you only have one class of share, dividends have to be paid on a pro rata basis. That's quite important. And it's uh, don't start trying to waive dividends from one director to another. And likewise, if you have spouses who are not particularly involved in the business, uh, if they're a director in the company, if they're uh, playing a part in the company, or if you've got providing security for the, or with personal assets for that company, then I think they're entitled to dividends. But the inland revenue are concerned about settlement of income. So just talk to your, uh, talk to your engagement director and just about what is going to be acceptable and what isn't going to be acceptable with regards your shareholdings in the company. So let's, let's think about dividends. The first £2,000 of dividends are um, free of tax. That's your total dividend. So if you've got a, a few British gas shares or uh, Shell shares there are now and uh, a few of the other privatisation type, type shareholdings and they're paying £52.60 a year or whatever, then you're 
you haven't got 2,000 hours of your company before you pay tax. You've got 1,946 pounds or whatever. Now, that's that's a that's a straightforward annual allowance, and I don't suppose that's going to change very much. What is changing is tax rates. So for dividends, the tax rate for if you're a lower rate taxpayer, so that's if your income is less than 50,270 uh, 50, pounds, then anything between anything up to that, you if you've got no other income, it's going to get taxed at 7.5%. If you're a higher rate taxpayer, which is at uh, from 50 through to well, 50,270 through to 150,000, then you're going to pay tax in theory at 40%. So on a dividend, tax is at 32.5%. And if you're a high rate taxpayer with a gross income in excess of 150,000, then you're going to be uh, paying dividend tax at 38.1%. However, all those are going up by 1.25% from 6th of April, 2022. So that lower rate is 8.75%. It will go to 33.75% because they are holding your annual allowances and the tax balance for the next three or four years. And then the high rate dividend uh, is 39.35%. Now, in trying to work out whether we want dividends or salaries, there's a little trap that you need to be aware of as well, because between gross income of, uh, of 100,000 and gross income of 125,000, um, £140, pounds, for every pound or every two pounds that you earn, you will lose one pound of your personal allowance, which actually means that between 100 and 125,000 or so, you've got a marginal tax rate of 60%. Where that's important is if you are having a salary and then the company is getting some tax relief on the salary, that salary is part of your gross income. So that could have you with uh, gross income in excess of 100,000. Of course, if you, the alternative is to take a dividend, you're not going to take the same amount of dividend as you would do salary because the company's got to pay some corporation tax on the income before you take the dividend. So you're going to be taking less because your gross income is less. And so there's one of the other parts of the calculations we need to think about is what is your total remuneration? Because for many of our clients, that's a little banana skin that is just too easy to slip up on. So again, for individuals, it all depends. The other complicating factor, I think uh, for some of our slightly more mature clients, should we say, who aren't uh, paying employees national insurance, those sums are different to if a couple of years ago when they were paying employees national insurance. And at that point, if you think about bonuses over profits or packages that might be sort of 60 or 70 thousand pounds, a, um, a salary might end up being better than dividends unless they get over 100,000. So there's a, it, it really does depend on your personal circumstances. So that's the, the dividend salary argument is going to continue rumbling on because for even a day, we've had dividend rates being less than salaries uh, and we have for the vast majority of employees, they're taking their salary. They've got employers' national insurance, employees' national insurance. Everybody knows where they are with things. For 
owner managed businesses, of course, they don't have the employment protection that they would do um, if they were in a conventional employment. So national insurance um, can be uh, can be reduced. Um, and the the owner managers are in a position to vary their salary or dividend as how, how they want. Of course, when things are difficult in the business, if you are taking money by way of dividend, it's got to come out of distributable profits. So if the company has actually made losses and those losses have exceeded any reserves in the business that have been built up in earlier years, and I'm thinking now about our COVID problems where a number of clients will have run into some difficulties. Um, if they've been taking dividends out because they think they've got a profit and it turns out that they haven't, then those dividends are either going to have to be repaid to the uh, company or they're going to, uh, to uh, be transferred to a director's loan account and we're going to talk about those, uh, those things in a minute. But dividends are where there aren't profits are a big problem. And we've certainly seen instances where that has created significant difficulties for the clients because they've funded those dividends through um, Bibbles loans, the, the, the bounce back loans. Uh, that's, that's the only way they could keep going. But of course, those bounce back loans always need repaying. They need repaying out of profits. And with those, if the dividends have uh, exceeded profits that could be extracted from the business, that's creating some tax problems for those clients. And it's in the two or three instances I can think about that come across my desk, we weren't spoken to about these sorts of things before the dividends were drawn. And we'd have been having a chat that said, do you really want to do that? So it, it's it's a uh, it's an area, dividends are, when the companies are, are making profits, dividends are a very good way of extracting funds. When a company is struggling, salary may be more appropriate because you're being paid for the day job. You have every reason to take a salary for that is reasonable for being paid for the day job. And then if the company were to go into an insolvent liquidation, the liquidator could not ask for that money back. Whereas if you've taken dividends out and the company were insolvent, the liquidator could. There's just so many different uh, things to think about. Uh, the other consideration I think is, uh, is about pensionable pay. Um, most people with a money purchase uh, pension scheme as part of their extraction of monies out of the company, they could have the company make pension contributions. Um, but be careful as to whether that there's a pension scheme in existence already. You've got to be careful as to the amounts you put in. Um, but you can make company contributions up to the total amount. Uh, to the total of, uh, of the revenue allowance that you have. And I'd be saying, talk to us. We'll then go and speak to our colleagues in uh, CHC Wealth Management and just discuss with them or ask you to discuss with them what your thoughts might be as regards um, pension contributions. Uh, but it, it's part of your remuneration package and it needs to be planned. So let's, uh, let's do it end. Now let's think about that director's loan account. Director's loan account can be positive or negative. If it's negative, let's call it overdrawn. And if it's positive, then you, the director, are owed money by the company. So when companies set up, frequently the directors will put some money in. If the company is a property company, very often the company 
directors will have put some assets in so that that property company can have a deposit for its first buy to let or whatever. So, so frequently directors, uh, uh, directors loan, loan accounts are positive and that's absolutely fine. Um, you can, you're a creditor of the company, uh, you can draw down on that director's loan account. Um, I think if you are owed a significant amount of money by the company and the company has some difficulties and looks like it may need to go into liquidation, then a liquidator would look at any extraction of funds to pay down your director's loan account in advance of any of your trade creditors, because that's a preference. So that's the only time I would be saying, be careful about drawing down on a positive director's loan account. Now, too many company directors uh, be their clients of ours and many that we've seen who aren't clients of ours um, would view the company bank account as part of their own funds and they are more than happy to take money out of the company um, use it for their own personal uh, uses and try and sort things out at the end of the year i think that's a mistake First of all, Companies Act says that directors' loan accounts that are overdrawn are illegal. Um, and if they exceed certain amounts, then they need to be, that fact needs to be disclosed. Uh, HMRC would turn around and say, if a director's loan account has not been cleared within nine months of the year end, then they will levy what they call a section 455 charge which is as if you've had a dividend out of the company, only it's not income tax. And that charge is at 32.5%. And it was set to match the dividend rates. So I think we can expect that charge to go up to 33.75% because the dividend tax rates have changed. I think we're waiting for final confirmation on that. However, it's an expensive, uh, it is expensive for the company to allow that director's loan account to stay overdrawn nine months after the year end, because the company is still going to have, on top of that charge, its corporation tax to pay, and it won't get the money back. It's effectively a loan to HMRC until that, that payment is turned into income or the loan has been repaid. And then the repayment comes back to the company sometime after the year end in which the, uh, which the loan account is turned back positive, yeah, like nine months. So it's, it's really not a good idea to, um, to, to let that loan account stay overdrawn. So just to touch what I spoke earlier, you pay yourself a salary or you pay dividends or you reimburse your expenses or you draw down a positive direct loan account, but you don't take money out of the company unless it's for one of those purposes. And if you do, then that's got to be made good. Now, if you if the company is profitable, then the directors can choose to appoint themselves a dividend, which will clear the director's loan account. That's fine, but you need to make the uh, made the decision, recorded it, and paperwork needs to be in place to cover that off. Um, backdated dividends, HMRC. Uh, can be uh, very upset about, uh, as with any backdated document. So you're not going to be wanting to do that. Um, I think you you should just be aware that HMRC will look at drawings after a year end. So if they think that they knew the company 
uh, director loan account was was overdrawn. If it continues uh, having payments taken out of it, and then in the commas, a dividend is sort of sudden voted um, to try and clear that, the revenue might turn around and say, well, that's cleared the most recent extractions. So they will look at a very clear timelines of what is owed and what isn't. And if the that loan account is in excess of £10,000, uh, there'll be a national insurance charge uh, due um, and, and, and a benefit because uh, there'll be a deemed interest benefit uh, for, for interest that hasn't been paid to the company. So it gets it gets messy if you have a direct loan account that's gone overdrawn. And I would urge you just to think carefully about what expenditures are going through the company, what what expenditures aren't, and you know, just if it's direct, if it's payments for a director, then talk to us, make sure that we are aware of it and can advise as to whether you need to vote yourself maybe some small additional dividends to cover private health, because you could have a company private health scheme. Uh, it's a benefit and it's uh, it, and, it, and it's taxable and there's employees national insurance available. But different, different individuals have different uh, views on whether they want to pay for private uh, health insurance. And if you've got two owners in the business and one wants that insurance, but the other one doesn't, it might be better that it's a, the payment premiums are posted to the director's loan account, but they then need to have some income that is going to cover those payments or it's a salary sacrifice. I think one of the other areas uh, where HMRC will attack or challenge uh, our clients is where there's what we may call entertaining and others may uh, view it as benefit. So I'm thinking season ticket, season tickets for football, so West Ham or, or whoever. If you are having the company pay for that season ticket, first of all, we want the, uh, the invoice addressed to the company. That's a, a no-brainer because if it's addressed to you personally, it will be deemed a benefit. If you have got just the one ticket, then that's more likely to be a benefit. Whereas if you've got two tickets and two or more tickets and you can show a list of different people that you've uh, provided for entertaining to uh, using that ticket, then HMRC would be viewing that as entertainment. You won't get tax relief on the, um, you, you just won't get tax relief on, on the, uh, on the charge in the accounts if it's entertaining. If it's deemed as a benefit, you'll get corporation tax relief, but then you're going to pay personal tax on it and employers national insurance. So it's almost as broad as it is long. What I am saying is just be careful about what expenditures go through the company that might have a dual use and make sure you've got some paperwork in place to prove that it's for the purposes of the business. Whether or not those purposes attract tax relief or not, they've got to be for the purposes of the business. So just be careful. All seems very negative, doesn't it? However, uh, the whole point is to try and avoid paying uh, tax on bits on income or expenditures that you weren't expecting to. And CHC, we want our clients to pay the least amount of tax they legally have to. So, yes, we will advise clients in the right direction to minimise those, uh, those charges. Um, just touching on a couple of other things, capital allowances. There's, there's the heart rate, so extra 100, well, it's 130% of uh, expenditure allowed uh, for first year allowances 
uh, to get the economy investing again. I think you just need to be aware you're still spending a pound or two, so probably 25p. And the way the, the rules have been constructed for capital analysis is that um, from, of course, from, from 6th of April, 1st of April rather, um, 2023, corporation tax is going to be at 25% in any case. So I'm not certain that um, expenditures that you would be making at some point in the future uh, attracting first year allowances at 25% as opposed to the current 19% plus 30%, which is to short of 25%. I'm not sure that it's such a massive boost for our clients. I think it helps, and I think it, you know, if, you, if, you, if you've got to spend that money now, because you need some kit now, uh, those capital allowances and the first year allowances are really useful. Of course, capital allowances, and there's many people out about uh, trying to sell capital allowances reviews, that really relates to uh, properties and uh, construction uh, on, on client premises. And I would ask you to keep records of the quotes, et cetera, so that when, if you've had building work done and there's some mechanical expenditures in there, like a lift or um, any items that can be removed from the building, then we need to know so that we can maximize the capital allowances that you can claim, because they're not so generous for straightforward property expenditure as in bricks and mortar. Finally, R&D tax credits. I think that's a, a question I get asked quite a few, a few times uh, during the course of the year. That's about trying to gain new knowledge and developing new products. It might be research, it might be applied research, it might be product development. But the point is it has to be about a good idea that isn't currently available as opposed to trying to develop uh, a product that, uh, that already exists. And I think it's right to look at any product development costs that you've got, because we want to make sure that you get the tax allowances and release that you're entitled to. And we will, if we're, if we're not certain about whether that expenditure is, is allowable or not, then we'll talk to um, people on your behalf to, to get some guidance. There's plenty of companies out there who would say they're specialist capital allowance, capital allowance or indeed R&D tax credit uh, specialists who give, uh, give a lot of uh, play on the uh, benefits they can bring to clients. And for some they do, but they will always charge a quite a meaningful percentage, 20, 25% of the tax that they would view that you have uh, been sa saved or recovered by them. So th there's costs attached to those sorts of services. It's something that we we do. We make uh, R&D claims for a number of clients and we're making the capital allowance claims for clients. So they're there, um, those releases are there, Let's, let's use them where we can. Thank you. Is there any questions? No questions at this stage, David. Thank you very much for such a, an informative presentation. Um, we have been recording this, so we'll make a, an on-demand version of this available on the website uh, later on today, and we'll also share this on our social channels. Um, we do have more FAQs coming out on our website and on the social channels, um, in addition to the, the uh, items we've covered today, so do look out for those. Thanks, David. Thank you.